Hello everyone. My name is Cheryl Fatibene. I am the Chief Nurse Practitioner Officer at the NNCC. And on behalf of the, NER the National Nurse-Led Care Consortium and the AANP, I would like to welcome you to today's Lunch and Learn webinar, Strategic Use of Practice Revenue in an NP-Run Diabetes Center. I will be moderating our presentation today and I thank you for your valuable time in joining us. Our main presenter today is Dr. Christine Batty, owner-operator of Diabetes Care Solutions, LLC. We will also hear from her partner at the Rhode Island Practice Transformation Network during this webinar. Before I begin the webinar, I would like to take care of some housekeeping issues. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available in the upcoming week on our NPSAN portal page and a link to the recording will be sent to all registrants. All participants will be muted throughout the presentation. I encourage you to please use the questions tab on your GoTo webinar control panel as seen here to ask your question. It will be relayed to the presenters and answered at the end of the webinar. A survey will pop up at the end of the webinar and be sent in an email later today. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey, evaluating this activity, as your feedback is critical to the ongoing development and presentation of our webinars. The slides for today's webinar are available as a handout, which you can access via the handouts pane in your control panel. You can click the name of the handout, and it will be downloaded via your default web browser. Let me take a quick moment to talk about the national investment taking place for quality improvement in the U.S. with the help of our federal government and the organizations who are presenting this content as part of the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. The Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, or TCPI, is CMS's largest ever investment in practice transformation with an investment of greater than $700 million over four years and an enrollment of 150,000 plus providers across the country. The NNCC, or the Nurse-Led Care Consortium, is a membership organization with over 250 nurse-led practices on our membership roster. Our mission is to advance nurse-led care through policy, consultation, and programs to reduce health disparities and meet people's primary care and wellness needs. Our partner in this initiative, the American Association of Nurse Practitioners, is the largest full-service national professional membership organization for NPs of all specialties. It is leading the way in advocacy, continuing education, and professional development for over 70,000 members. CMS funded the NNCC and the AANP to support enrollment of NPs into practice transformation networks, or PTNs, across the country, and to develop NP-specific educational material that facilitates practice transformation in advance of the upcoming payment reform changes with CMS. The NNCC and AAN are the only nursing-focused grantee of the TCBI project. The NNCC and the AANP agree that this initiative is important to ensure nurse practitioners receive the, the support they need to remain competitive in a changing healthcare landscape. NPs are the future of primary care in the United States and already provide high quality and cost-effective care. This initiative is an opportunity for NPs to prove it by helping CMS and the broader healthcare community to recognize their contribution using practice transformation while preparing for value-based reimbursement. CMS is not providing this funding out of the goodness of their hearts. They want to use this program to prepare clinicians across the country for payment reform. In particular, payment reform under MACRA, the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. Many of you have probably heard of MACRA, legislation that was passed to establish Medicare's Quality Payment Program, or QPP. It hasn't been finalized yet, but under the Quality Payment Program, there are two payment adjustment mechanisms to incentivize quality tied to Medicare Part, Part B payments. MIPS, or the Merit-Based Incentive Plan, and Advanced APMs, or the Advanced Alternative Payment Models. 
most clinicians will end up associated with MIPS, or the Merit-Based Incentive Plans. The details of all of this aren't as important as the general trend. MIPS involves four elements that clinicians need to demonstrate successfully to maximize their Medicare Part B payments. These elements are to report on quality, to report on resource use, to identify clinical practice improvement or CQI activities they are engaged in in their practices, and to use health IT effectively. Even if you think that MACRA and MIPS doesn't apply to you, if you can demonstrate these four elements in your practice, you can succeed in a value-based payment environment. The TCPI and their networks are meant to provide clinicians with the skills necessary to execute these four elements of practice. We know NPs have a large growing role in the delivery of health care, especially primary care. The NNCC and AANP want to connect NPs to TCPI-funded practice transformation networks, or PTNs. These peer-based learning networks have the responsibility for enrolling and supporting clinicians. They provide free boots on the ground, technical assistance, and services to help realize practice transformation. How can we, as NPs, help PTNs by serving as leaders in their networks? NPs are more familiar with many aspects of the change package than physicians are. NPs have experience working in collaborative, interdisciplinary, and team-based environments. The PTNs can provide nurse practitioners and nurse-led health centers with critical resources for practice improvement, access to larger networks of clinical peers, which pulls NPs and smaller nurse-managed health centers out of isolation. We will hear next from one of those PCN, PTNs, specifically Randy Bellhumer, the Senior Program Developer for the Rhode Island Practice Transformation Network, with information about their work in supporting the TCPI movement. Randy Bellhumer comes to the TCPI project with over 16 years of experience in community and public health, where she has managed both state and federal grant programs. As a registered dietitian, she also worked in a myriad of clinical settings, including long-term and primary care. As a program developer for the TCPI project, Randy is working towards cultivating collaboration among primary care and specialty practices, such as the Diabetes Care Solutions Clinic and Christine Batty, to promote TCPI. Randy, at this point, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Cheryl, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this webinar today. And I also want to thank in advance Dr. Batty for your leadership in Rhode Island, um, and in particular sharing your successes with um, our Rhode Island clinicians today, as well as us clinicians across the country in our community of practice, um, specifically in your strategies um, in the area of strategic use of revenue. Um, next slide, please. So the Rhode Island Practice Transformation Network, which is housed at the Rhode Island Quality Institute in Providence, Rhode Island, is one of the 29 PTNs, which Cheryl was referring to earlier, which is funded through CMS to support both primary care and specialists in succeeding under the quality payment program. The bullets in this particular slide outline what we're working towards with our practices. And I would add that a good chunk of our practices here in Rhode Island are actually specialists, which is really exciting to be working with this cohort in addition to our primary care physicians. And next slide, please. And this slide is just sharing with you information on how it looks like local payment reform efforts are also going to be tied to value over volume. And um, it appears that they are all slowly going to be following suit in this regard. So TCPI gives you the opportunity to prepare your practice for these changes. Um, and I'm going to turn it now back over to um, Cheryl to introduce Dr. Batty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randy, and thank you for being on our webinar today. We certainly appreciate the work of the PTNs and your time. 
so I would now like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Christine Batty, owner-operator of Diabetes Care Solutions in Greenville, Rhode Island. A little bit about Dr. Batty. She has been a nurse for 24 years, and for 15 of those years, she's been a nurse practitioner. During that time, she has always been focused on the care of those with diabetes. In 2005, Christine began her career in diabetology with diabetes education. In 2013, she successfully opened Diabetes Care Solution, a specialty practice specializing in the comprehensive management of diabetes. Dr. Batty is currently providing for her patients. She is conducting research in the psychosocial aspects of diabetes and provides education and mentoring for local nurse practitioners, nurses, and healthcare providers. Of her many recognitions include the 2014 Rhode Island State Award for Excellence by the AANP. She also serves as the president for uh, NPARI, a Rhode Island-based nurse practitioner group. She holds memberships in the following organizations, Sigma Theta Tau International, AANP, AADE, or the American Association of Diabetes Educators, and the Eastern Nursing Research Society. At this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Christine Batty. Christine? Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Very excited to have everybody here listening. Um, one of the first questions I typically have when people look at my alphabet soup after my name is, first, am I crazy? Um, second, what are all those initial me initials mean and why did I go ahead and get my credentialing? I think it's important to talk about that a little bit in terms of um, what, what I do for a living and how I got to be able to do, do what I do and on my own practice. Um, back when I was a nurse, um, actually going further back, when I was a child, um, diabetes ran in the family and I was always very intrigued by diabetes educators and I promised myself I would be a diabetes educator someday um, so that I could help patients like my grandfather and my sister were helped. So. Lo and behold, I became a nurse. Of course, I moved forward um, and became a nurse practitioner, as you know. Um, I became a family nurse practitioner because I liked the broad population that that certification serves. Um, I so typically treat pediatrics. I typically treat adults and gerontology. However, um, I do um, follow the family model. Looking also at my next credential, um, I am board certified in advanced diabetes management. Um, this credential is given by the American Diabetes, uh, diabetes Educator Association. Um, it helps me to keep on the cutting edge of diabetes care. Um, it keeps me involved in what's going on in the nation and the world in terms of diabetes care. I think this is important to give me a little bit of um, credibility, if you were, um, to what I do for a specialty. Um, being a diabetes educator, as I said, was a key um, goal of mine. And I am a nationally certified educator, which is the, the, the certified diabetes educator um, credential you see. And I'm also a state-based uh, educator, so that I can serve those in Rhode Island. So um, the alphabet soup is laid out there. And I think that all of these credentials um, help me in terms of being able to be the best in my practice. Um, it also helps me with reimbursement, quite honestly. So there's a couple of different reasons why um, I chose to have these credentials. Um, I want to just speak quickly to a couple of the memberships that I hold. I think that um, in, in practice, we're so focused on practice and patients um, that when we look around, we kind of lose sight of, of um, being associated with other practitioners. I think that it is important in terms of everyday practice, but also if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, you need to be reaching out to others. For a long time in my practice, I was kind of in a silo um, in an endocrinology practice that was a little bit more with closed doors. Um, and the way that I was able to learn from others um, was to be associated with, with groups such as the Nurse Practitioner Alliance, um, Sigma, 
the AAMP and AADE, and I do participate in conferences, and I've presented at those conferences. And my other favorite conference and in, in group is the Eastern Nursing Research Society. Um, this gives me a little bit different perspective. It does um, keep me in, in touch with nursing as a whole. So I'm talking about um, nursing theory, when I go to this conference, it's kind of like the Comic-Con of nursing theorists. All those people that we learned about in school way back when um, are there. So it's very interesting to see where our knowledge comes from, how it's developed, and how we as practitioners can put it into, um, into practice and use it for our patients. You can go to the next slide. So back when I was a nurse practitioner school, I probably even before that, I decided that I wanted to have my own practice. Um, back then, I don't really think that it was possible. Honestly, I don't think we had full practice authority. I know we did not um, as nurse practitioners in the state of Rhode Island, but I had this goal. And in 2012, 2013, I, re I made the goal happen. Um, I started out in a very base with a very, very, very basic idea of starting a diabetes care practice. My intention was to start by renting an exam room and seeing patients. Just me. Well, that plan kind of expanded, and I ended up with an office with me as the major provider for the medical piece as well as the diabetes education, which I love, and I had a medical assistant. How did I go about setting this up? I will never know. Lots of family support, lots of, um, lots of uh, professional support. Um, but mainly learning the craft before I got to, the, got to my own goal, um, absorbing everything that I saw in other practices that I worked in. Learning coding and billing was a huge piece to this. When I looked at how to start a practice, I had to figure out who was going to pay me. How was I going to support this practice? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I think I started out with very naive. Um, and we know commercial insurance, CMS, those types of fundings come in, and we don't know enough about how we are going to actually get paid or are getting paid. So I think that um, that was a bit of a learning curve, and we all go through that on every day, everyday basis. Um, later on, I learned about incentives. I was very surprised to get my first incentive check, quite honestly, from CMS um, and also Blue Cross. So that was a nice surprise, and it really gave me um, not only an incentive, which is obviously what it's for, but it gave me a footing to move this practice further so I could reach the needs of the patients. You can go to the next slide. So over time, we are now in our fourth year, beginning our fifth year in January, I was able to add services to the practice. Um, I realized that we absolutely positively needed to have a dietitian who would also be a diabetes educator. I needed a separate diabetes educator for myself because I couldn't handle the, the numbers anymore. With some creative um, business techniques, I was able to add those two people to practice without really raising overhead um, and, and at the same time meet the patient's needs and increase some revenue. We're now adding more services that are necessary for people with diabetes. We're adding glucose monitoring, we're adding testing for, you know, uh, peripheral artery disease. We're doing weight loss groups here. And this would not be possible without being creative in terms of revenue, incentive payments, um, and, and basically quality, quality initiatives, meeting the needs of our patients and getting them healthy. At this point, I have my practice is at just over 750 patients, um, and we are growing rapidly, um, and we are hoping to expand even further soon. So um, we're excited to, to, to say that. You can go to the next slide. So when people ask me what the biggest challenge was to independent practice, um, it was money, I would definitely say, and it was learning how to be a business person. Uh, we all in in healthcare are running a business of one one form or another, whether we realize it or not. Uh, we are on a daily basis billing for our services. We're expecting payment back from our services, but we don't really know where all that information comes from. Where does the money come from? How can we um, do it more efficiently? I will say that just I had very like I had said previously, I had lots of 
um, advice and support from professionals who are experts in this field. But there was a little bit more to it, an independent practice for a nurse practitioner. Now, fortunately, Rhode Island is a very um, ahead of the ahead of the grain state. We have had full practice authority for several years. We've had global signature authority, meaning that our signature is equal to a physician signature um, in the state of Rhode Island. That does not include federal, so that's a little bit different. So there are a couple of challenges with that, but we have. Um, we have authority to run our own practices without collaboration, without formal collaboration or supervision um, by a physician. Now, that is all fabulous and everything is great and it's working out wonderfully. The insurers, for the most part, will um, credential us in that manner according to state law. Unfortunately, there is one particular insurer who's still trying to catch up with the cutting edge um, and, and need for nurse practitioners. So Blue Cross Blue Shield in the state of Rhode Island still requires collaboration with physician on site. That was a problem for me um, initially, but I have actually um, not had that challenge for a little bit now because Blue Cross is, is now changing their policies and coming up to, um, to match the law a little bit uh, closer now. Other challenges are such things as pharmacies out of state not acknowledging my patients in state. So we're working on things like that. Um, it is always a, there's always a challenge um, for any practitioner about what their credentials are, what is their, why are they the specialist, why are they the best, what have you. Nurse practitioners face probably a little bit more than that, um, in my opinion, because you know, we're nurses. We've, we've heard this, we all know this. Um, why are you seeing a nurse practitioner when I'm a physician, or um, why are you seeing a nurse practitioner when you can see such and such? Um, I think that it's important for us to get the word out on that. I think that um, doing this presentation actually gets the word out on, on the fact that nurse practitioners have a role in healthcare, and we all there's enough of us to go around. There's enough uh, patients that need us to go around, and hopefully this challenge will be less and less over time. Um, and by the way, happy Nurse Practitioner Week to everybody, um, and also happy Diabetes Awareness Week. Um, so I think that some of these challenges are actually dissipating, um, and now just the financial and the business aspects seem to be the biggest hurdle um, for any healthcare provider. You can go to the next slide. So my practice, as I said, we have about 750 patients. We see about 250 patients per month, depending on um, holidays and things like that. As we all know, if we had to take a day off, we're not making money and seeing patients. So this is a typical pair mixed graph for the practice. This one happens to be from September, I believe. Um, you can see that the majority of my patients are Blue Cross Blue Shield Rhode Island patients, second to Medicare. Um, that, this does not include the dual patients. So you can see that there is a, a um, significant portion of my patients that do have Medicare. Um, looking at this, there are some challenges for Medicare, so Medicare patients. We all know what the challenges are, but more so in diabetes care, seeing Medicare patients can be a challenge because things like diabetes education are not necessarily covered unless we have special certification for the practice. Um, so it's, it's important to keep that in mind as you're moving forward with whatever practice you're going to be running, knowing where you're in for your, for your funding and your reimbursements coming from. Um, you can see on this graph that I do not see a lot of Medicaid patients, um, although I think I see more than what is being presented here more recently. Again, this does not, does not include the dual eligible. I do accept all insurances. It just happens that that's the lay of the land around here, and that's um, my population. And that we do not exclude any, any insurance for this practice. You can go to the next slide. So the incentive programs out there, um, this is really a, a big piece to my, pra my practice. And as I said initially, I was surprised when I got my first check. Um, I was like, wow, what is this little check from CMS, and what is this little check from Blue Cross, and where am I getting this money from? Um, again, I was naive. 
as I learned more and more about billing and reimbursement, I realized that just by doing certain things for my patients, which I do all the time, and I think we all do all the time, we always make sure our A1Cs are at the best they can be. We are trying to make sure the eye exams are done. All those HEDIS pieces that we are always trying to reach for and the standards that we're trying to follow to keep our healthy, patients healthy is actually giving, we're actually earning re, uh, reimbursement from it. Looking at the incentive programs that I earned from my, for my practice, I get the PCIP incentive payment. We're going to look at more about that in a minute. Um, I think we all know this, but eScript and EHR use um, do give us incentive, specifically for CMS, um, but it also helps us avoid a penalty. Uh, there was a time in my practice that I felt that the EHR uh, was killing me financially, quite honestly. It is very expensive. Um, and we talked about stopping it and going back to paper charts. But the penalty that what I, I would receive for not using an EHR um, was not worth it. It would, have, it would have not benefited the budget, and it probably would have reduced um, out for patients and, and to other providers and things like that, which is so very important in this, um, in this world where we need to communicate so well. Uh, a new program in the state of Rhode Island um, is being run by uh, one of the healthcare systems called Lifespan. They, are, they consist of several hospitals, um, private practices, clinics, and things uh, such as that. And they actually started a program for providing diabetes management incentive payments to providers like me. Um, every patient that meets their, their targets as designated by not only HEDIS but the Diabetes Case Managers for Lifespan um, in relation specifically to diabetes um, gets an incentive for themselves but $50 per case goes to the provider. Um, I don't know, it, it kind of, you know, I kind of feel funny about that, receiving money for something that I normally do anyway and it is part of my quality care. But I think that it's important to point out to providers how very important diabetes management is. We all know that diabetes um, really is a huge, um, has a huge impact on patients and our people in the United States and the budget in the United States. So um, I'm also getting an incentive from Blue Cross for pay for performance. It's a very small amount because I am not a primary care provider, but in fact I do get that incentive. So all these little things add up and it does help me in terms of um, running the practice. You can go to the next slide. So incentives, EHR, quality. Um, I think we all know about each one of these things. I think we know that EHR at this point is here to stay. It may not be one of our most favorite things in the world. I think that it is very labor intensive, and I, I do have that as one of the challenges here. I think that we haven't found um, maybe the perfect way to document. Um, there, there are lots of different challenges with EHR, but it's here to stay, and we really need to make the best of it. In every EHR, or most EHRs, there is a way to track your quality, initi your, your quality initiatives. We all do quality, whether we're thinking about it, whether we're documenting it, whatever we're doing, we are doing it. Um, I had a conversation yesterday with my representative from Rhode Island Quality Initiative, and she was assessing the practice for where I am in terms of um, getting ready for the new payment models. And she asked me, how do you document your quality initiatives? How do you track how you are I'm doing this. And quite honestly, when I set my EHR up, that was not my, my important point. My important point was how do I document that I saw the patient and I wrote a prescription. When I set this practice up, that was the focus. Well, now looking back on it four years later, I know what power my EHR has and I need to use it to, my, to the best of my ability so that I can show how well my patients are doing the quality I'm giving. And then, you know, if a little bit of money comes my way because of the incentives, because I've hit those quality points, then all the better. So one of the challenges that I have had is setting up that data capture. Um, I am working with the HR company for my, my practice. We are working on making sure that I'm looking at all the proper numerators and denominators 
and getting that information together. But it's also important for me to be able to identify what data I want to look at. And I think that that's something we all need to learn. You know, what, what is it that we want to look at? What are we trying to do for our patients? And how do we, um, how do we find that data? Um, so it, as much as a data capture and setting up of the HR is a challenge, it's also a positive. You know, if you're looking at for, you know, how are my patients doing? Am I, am I doing well? Am I getting my patients to target? Um, I can push a button on my EHR and I can say, yes, my A1C numbers have come down by a certain percentage for my population. Or, or the flip side, wow, I really haven't been doing as well as I thought. And what can I do to change that? Um, identifying the progress that you've made is important. We have to do that. So one of the um, incentives that I have is the primary care incentive payment. Now, no, many people are probably receiving this, and they're probably not aware of it. Maybe they're in a group, and they didn't know they were getting it. Um, they are not realizing that they qualify for it. These are incentive payments by CMS that are made on a quarterly basis and will equal 10% of the amount paid for primary care services under Medicare. Now, as I already said, and as you know, I'm not a primary care provider, but I have, because I am a nurse practitioner, I qualify under this program, and because of the way that my services are being um, given, I qualify. And CMS identifies this. I ha you don't have to register for this. You don't need to ask to be part of the program. CMS identifies everyone who is eligible, and they pull the data up, and they send in the incentive. So currently, on a, on a quarterly basis, I think the lowest number I've had is 20 incentive claims, and we've gone up to 40 or more. Um, it does make a, it makes a difference. It's several hundred dollars. It's very nice to get that, and it's very nice to, to know that you're doing the things you're supposed to be doing. So that's a, a big part of my budget. You can go to the next slide. If you think about the way that everyone practices, I think that it's important to have a, a model to follow. In my practice, and I think this is probably true of many, I follow the chronic care model. Now, if I sat down and I asked my staff what model we follow, I'm not sure that they would come up with this particular picture. But Diabetes Care Solutions has a model, and it is a microscopic form of the chronic care model. We have our patients in the center. We have our own community within the office. We have our health systems within the office. We are proactive. We have an informed, activated patient, and we, we run under this model constantly. If I expand Diabetes Care Solutions out into the larger community, even just out into the town of Greenville, and then further out into to, um, the state of Rhode Island, I still follow this model. And I think that this model is important to be looked at, and, and it has been around for quite a while, because it does hit on every point of all the initiatives and the incentives and the quality indicators that we all try to, um, to provide for our patients. So I think that identifying that is actually very important and to know what model you're trying to work under. You can go to the next slide. One of the things in terms of chronic care management that um, I, I, we have found, and I'm sure everybody is, is having the same struggle, chronic care is labor intensive. It is, um, it is difficult to do in a 15-minute appointment. It takes a long time to be able to connect with a patient and meet their needs and get them healthy. Unfortunately, in my practice at least, and I know that this is true in other places, I'm giving away free care. Now, I don't care about giving away free care necessarily. I'll do what I need to do for my patients. But it does have, have a detrimental effect on, on the overhead. If I can't meet the overhead head, I can't be here for my patients. So a typical day of diabetes care solutions includes calls coming in from patients stating that their blood sugar is abnormal, that they just had, let's say, a steroid injection, or they have the flu, or they're having a colonoscopy, and they are giving us their blood sugar reports, and I am making medical decisions on what I need to do with their medication for the situation at hand. If you think about just one of those phone calls and the time it takes and the skill it takes to not only fetter out the data from the patient but then take the action and document it, it takes quite a while. 
And this is the key to keeping people with diabetes healthy, keeping them engaged, keeping communications open, and giving them a support system. Well, if I do five or ten of those phone calls a day, it becomes um, you know, a, a little bit tough to handle. Um, in terms of CMS, they have actually taken a step, and it's part of the Affordable Care Act, where we are now able to get paid for this service. So the chronic care management program, um, you can see the CPT code there, is a program where if you have had tw 20 minutes of time spent with a patient and it does not need to be face-to-face, -face, any contact with the patient counts toward 20 minutes and you get paid somewhere in the ballpark of $43. Well, if I do a, several of those phone calls for patients who are ill and I get paid $43, well, good for me. Um, more importantly, good for the patient. It gives us the ability to provide better care for our patients if we're getting reimbursed for the services we're giving. You can go to the next slide. When I looked at this, the chronic care management program and reimbursement and, and what have you, I was very hesitant. Um, Cheryl had, and I were talking about this, and it's a very intimidating thing to, to ask a patient to pay for the services that you had previously been giving out of the goodness of your heart. And she was you know, joking with me about why would you get paid nothing for a service you're giving. Well, because that's what we do as providers. We help patients. We talk to them after hours. We engage with them. But I, I started looking at it in a, different, in a different manner. I have a lot of patients in this practice, as most patient people who care for diabetes patients have, that can't get the services that they need to keep themselves healthy. Whether it is a transport issue, whether it's a communication issue, whether it's an insurance coverage issue. So the CCM program allows me to do things for those patients that I couldn't do before. And that is the key to this is have a, helping them reach their self-management goals. So I took the CCM program and I created a program for those patients here. It's now an intensive management program um, for my patients that need more, more intervention. They can now speak to the educator on the phone and we're going to, um, it, they get the, the service they need and we get reimbursed for it. We're going to meet our indicators better and we're going to be um, helping those patients get to self-management goals. You can go to the next slide. Let me give you an example. I have a 70-year-old female with unstable blood glucose. She is known for swinging her blood sugar somewhere between the levels of being unconscious, literally, and up into the 600s. And it really, she has other comorbidities. Um, her illnesses um, really impact her blood sugar quite dramatically. And she's had some very unstable issues in the past several weeks. We do frequent phone intervention with her. We um, have her bring her meter, her glucose meter, to the office. We upload the data. I give her instructions on adjusting medications. Um, we have had a problem with getting her in to see a diabetes educator because, unfortunately, currently we are not certified um, as a diabetes education site for Medicare. We're working on that. So her, what I could do for her in some respects was limited. You can go to the next slide. When, I, when we started using the chronic care management uh, program here, more, you know, known as the intensive program for my Medicare patients, we are reaching out to this particular woman on a weekly basis or more. Several times I've spoken to her in between when she's had a problem. But we, we review her blood sugars with her and do medication management on at least a weekly basis. She has had contact by the diabetes educator for doing problem solving to figure out you know, what is happening that's causing some of the instability, answering her questions, talking to her husband, who is the person that's caring for her. And we have documented all of that work. With documenting and, and um, looking at these numbers and having such intensive uh, inter interaction with this woman, she has had less major events over the past couple of months now. Her glycemic control has improved. She has not had one unconscious event. And we've actually identified a few things um, through her diabetes educator conversations that were probably happening. Uh, insulin administration may be incorrectly, timing may be incorrectly, that we did not know before. 
So this has had a, a positive impact on this patient, and we've been able to um, get reimbursed for the services that we have provided. Now, I did get um, a claim back, a payment back on this, and I, you know, I didn't believe it until I saw it. We're supposed to be getting paid about $43 per claim for chronic care management billing, and in fact, that is what we were paid. Um, I was pleasantly surprised. I was also pleasantly surprised to see that the, the that CMS did not take the obligatory 15% off the top that nurse practitioners um, usually qualify for. So this uh, this has been a great great case, uh, great situation for an alternate uh, revenue source, but also more importantly, keeping the patient healthy. You can go to the next next slide. Next slide. Just in the interest of time, we're going to move through um, the the second case and on to your, to your next slides. You can actually skip the second case if you want. It just it's a it just a quick patient who's getting ready for surgery. That's all. So. Next steps in my program, looking at the at different um, pieces that we've now identified in the pro, in the in the process of working with Rhode Island Quality Initiative, um, the, our PTN, we're going to be expanding our chronic care management program. We're going to uh, work toward becoming a patient-centered specialty practice, and again, that is going to be helping me focus on the quality points that I need to make sure that I'm serving the patients and the, that, that the issues that they need. Um, we have already um, started working with Rhode Island Quality Institute. We are doing our, our practice assessment, and we are um, developing different strategies on how to meet the needs of the patient, setting up a more formal smoking cessation program, uh, really instituting our depression screening more formally, working on workflow issues that, um, you, know, you know, identifying high-risk patients, things like that, that are going to help me identify the next steps for quality. Um, one of my other issues and goals is to expand the knowledge of Rhode Island nurse practitioners. Um, as the president of the NPARI, I have the ability to reach out so that I can educate um, many many providers in the state and and help everybody move forward with this. You go to the next slide. So lessons learned, lessons learned from opening my practice, from being a provider in the year 2016. Um, I, I really would recommend that everybody learn as much as they can about the coding and the billing process. Whether you're in a group or if you're individual, it doesn't matter. You really need to look at how you're coding um, your visits and making sure you're getting, you're capturing all the hard work that you're doing. Um, know what is being billed. You, know, you could be writing whatever codes on your checkout slip or in your computer. You should really look back to see how that washed out. Um, know what is going out so that you know um, what you're supposed to be getting in, quite honestly. Um, making sure you are up to date with your insurers. Get their newsletters. They send out newsletters by email all the time. Um, make sure that you're up to date with their incentives, their new billing codes, their old billing codes. Um, stay, stay up to date with that because if you don't know how to bill correctly, um, you're not going to get paid correctly, quite honestly. Um, Always start out with the quality indicator documentation from the beginning. That's my biggest learning, learning curve. Um, do it now. Don't say I'll do it next week after this week has been very busy. I'll do it after Thanksgiving. Look at it now. Start documenting it so that you know where you need to go and where you are. You can go to the next slide. For people who are considering opening a practice, I say go for it. Um, I am a very big proponent of nurse entrepreneurship, healthcare entrepreneurship in general. Um, things to start out by asking yourself, um, why are you considering this? Are you, are you considering this you know, because you're just mad at the person you're working for? Well, that's probably not a good idea to do it. Um, are you considering it because you see a vision 
of a practice that you know can work and will serve people, that absolutely move forward. Um, who do you want to serve? Who, what population is it? Know where you're going to be providing your services. Who can help you on this mission? Um, I, I met many people on my, on my travels to starting out my, my practice. Um, know who can and will be able to help you on this. And you never know who will be able to help you with this um, in terms of motivation or financial support or just education. Um, and what you need, you have to know what you need to reach your goal. If you look at what your goal is, you want to open a practice, you know, let's say in diabetes, um, you have to know what kind of credentialing you need. Do you need further education? Do you need to take a class? Do you need to just go and do it? Knowing where you are to get where you're going is important. And if you have a passion, it will lead to success. That is my biggest, um, rec biggest piece of advice to anybody. If you have a passion, follow it. But make sure you have a framework that will help you get there. You can go to the next slide. So that's my contact information. As Cheryl had said earlier, I am I'm a mentor for many people. I, I teach people about diabetes care. I teach nurses about nursing. I, am, I, I kind of do a little bit of everything. So if anybody out there is looking for help in terms of anything we talked about today, including entrepreneurship, please reach out to me. Um, I love to teach. I love to mentor. So I'm available at any time. Thank you so much, Dr. Batty, for doing this and for bringing this information to our group. Um, I'd just like to now remind everybody that this is the time. If you haven't chatted in a question at this point and you do have a question for our presenters, for either Randy or for um, Christine Batty, please type it into the question tab on your GoToWebinar control pa panel or raise your hand. We do have a few questions that have come in already. So now would be the time if you do want to chat them in, we would be happy to take those questions. I'm going to turn this over to Tiffany now. She's going to read through some of the questions that have come in. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, and again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Batty. We really appreciate your time, expertise, and just making yourself available to us this afternoon. So uh, a number of questions came in uh, during uh, your presentation, and I'm just going to go in, in order. So the first question was asked by Joan, and she had just a simple inquiry of which EHR system you use. I use uh, eClinical Works, and uh, you know, I, I will, the, the one thing I will tell you about EHRs, you can research EHRs for a very long time, and you're always going to go, for, you know, you're going to find the thing you think is the, big, the best fit. You'll be frustrated in the beginning until you get to know the program, and then you'll be able to make it work very well. So. Um, some people use free EHR, some people use um, non-free EHR. Um, you really have to think about what you are trying to accomplish in your program or your practice and make it work, but find the one that fits you the best. Don't, don't just go out and say everybody's using EPIC or everybody's using eClinical. You really need to look at what you're trying to do in your practice when you're choosing this. Great, thank you. And then a number of questions came in with regards to um, uh, your experience and use of the chronic care model uh, CPT code. So the first one, again, is by Joan, and she is asking, can a patient be coded for chronic care management by you in the same month that they might have uh, had tra have a transition of care event, possibly coded by a primary care physician? If, there, if, if a patient has already been uh, registered for chronic care management by another provider, you cannot bill in the same month as that other provider. And I do believe, if I remember correctly, that transition, um, transitional care does qualify in that same category. So um, that part of uh, chronic care management, the chronic care management protocol or program is that they have to sign a uh, release and permission to bill. And what part of what we do is ask if they're already registered with other pro providers. Great, thank you. Uh, next, uh, how does your practice handle the copay for CCM? Well, it is a very brand new program to us. We really just started launching it a couple of months ago. Um, at this point, it is going to be billed out by our billing company. So far, the copay looks it's somewhere between zero and about six dollars. Um, and the patients are the advice of that. That is part of our um, our 
contract that they sign with us that they will be responsible most likely for a copay around six to eight dollars. So they are aware of that ahead of time. Great, thank you. Uh, the next uh, two questions are from Amy, and again, it's regards to the uh, the CCM CPT code. And she asks, uh, if, it, if it is a one-time phone call, does this count as it states? Um, excuse me. If the, if the phone call is inclusive of 20 minutes, it will count for the, it'll go toward the CCM for the month. And then you can do numerous, you can do numerous actions, and on my particular EHR, it will calculate the time as we're working on the computer on that patient's record. If you if you work on a, if you have an interaction with a patient at night, you know you're on call, you speak to them at night, you're not on the computer, you can actually back back time that and document it. And there's a lot of documentation that goes into it that the, my EHR brings up automatically, so it's preset to to identify what it's able to be built. Can um, um, Dr. Batty, what with regards to an EMR, if their practice has a, a patient portal, does this count? Um, as well for communication, or is it only verbal communication? It actually counts for any type of communication. Uh, we have not started using it. We have our portal ready to, to, to go. We have not used that, so I can't speak to how um, what the calculation would be in terms of my EHR, how it, it comes up in, in terms of the EHR. But um, if the patient is accessing the portal, no, that does not count. Um, if you're talking to the patient on the phone, if you're talking, if you're sending in prescriptions, if you're talking to other providers, things like that, and it's related to patient care, yes, it does count. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Lisa. Uh, Lisa is asking, does your nurse or medical assistant do some of the contacting for the CCM patients? And how yes. do you document these contacts with CCM patients in your EHR? Um, is there a special form you've developed or addendums? Okay, my, my staff is involved in that, you know, particularly the phone calls related to blood sugar reports. Um, we have a, our tradition in our office is that we put an encounter, um, a note in for every conversation that we have. So as, as my secretary is taking blood sugars, we have a grid that we fill it in and we put all the numbers, the times, their current symptomatology, their current uh, insulin, you know, what, what procedure is coming up. They send it to me, I respond to it. Um, whether I speak to the person, patient directly or if they call the patient with instructions or we mail an instruction sheet, whatever the intervention is, it will then be completed and documented in the chart um, immediately. And, and pay, at any contact, uh, you, the, you have to designate people within this, our, my EHR of people that are allowed to put into the CCM notes, uh, and my staff will is included in that. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Lakitra. Um, she is asking, would the CCM CPT code for 20 minutes of patient contact be the same as care plan oversight, or is it something different? Um, well, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I know the answer to that, but part of CCM is developing a care plan. Um, that the initial, what I have found is when I initially enter the patient into the CCM program, the care planning does take quite a bit of time and it doesn't it is included in that um, coding however you know, down the line second month third month the patient is in the program the care planning is updated and it's not as labor intensive so it's, it, in terms of a, the CCM care planning development yes it includes that but in terms of other care planning I, I don't know that I could give a, an accurate answer to that but I'm thinking that I probably would great thank you um, and the last question is uh, by Amy again, and Amy's asking if you do group visits and how does that work with regards to billing? I would love to do group visits. It's what my other my other goal for the, the, the coming year. I keep talking about doing group visits, um, but somehow the coordination of that can, continues to escape me. Um, in terms of CCM and group visits, I don't think that I would apply the CCM to those visits right now. Uh, because you can, you're billing for the patient being present. So if you're seeing a patient in person and it is a 992139921 a regular routine uh, office visit, you would not include that in the CCM. Um, in terms of you saw a patient in the office for a routine follow-up and then you know the next day there was a follow-up call, say from my educator to them, then the CCM would be for the second the second day interaction.
Standard Time. This presentation will fe feature Dr. Jan Towers, founding member of the AANP and leading policy expert. Jan will dive into the details of the quality payment program and its impact on nurse practitioners, most notably the changes and updates outlined in the CMS final rule, which was published in mid-October. So this is definitely something that I would encourage everyone to come and participate. She'll also be able to answer your questions. The registration for this event will be circulated shortly. Please be on the lookout and reach out to us to learn more about our work. Again, I thank you for being with us today. I'd like to close out.